you. Hello, and welcome to day six of the virtual ENC Spring Fair. I am Lori Whalen, the Assistant Director of the Environmental Nature Center, and I just popped out of this stump like the Lorax to tell you about what's going on today. I'm also going to tell you that um, I've, I've been working at the Nature Center since I believe 2003. Uh, the, the folks putting on the Spring Fair said, Lori, tell them a little bit about yourself. So out of the stump since 2003, here we are in the Redlands. All right, first I'm going to thank our sponsors. Um, Farmers and Merchants Bank has helped us make this happen. Thank you so much, Farmers and Merchants. We also have several other sponsors, lots of Saver OC sponsors, but I'm going to tell you about some specific sponsors. We have Stephen Walsh and Wesley Williams Group sponsoring the fair. And we also have the Dennerline family, hi Celeste and Bob, um, sponsoring the Butterfly House. Also sponsoring the Butterfly House is the Flower Child Fest Festival. Hi, Stacy. And then we also have Janet Lee Crockman, CPA, sponsoring our Fire Circle Stage. Thank you, Janet. We love you. Um, we also have Silent Auction Donors. This is not even a complete list by far because people keep adding donations every single day. The silent auction is gonna be so exciting. We have at least 40 items right now as I film this and by the time you see it, they'll probably be 50 or more. Something for everyone. Hopefully, I'll get some of those great wine auction items. Let's see. I'm also going to tell you about, these are my fancy, fancy uh, flip cards. More about the silent auction. Um, this is what the web page looks like. Don't worry, we're going to reuse this paper multiple times and then we're going to recycle it. I just wanted you to know how user friendly and lovely it looks. Um, you can get to the silent auction by going to encenter.org and clicking on the Spring Fair page and then you'll find a link from there. So here's what's going on today. May 16th, starting um, after I finish talking, you'll get to see a uh, craft from the craft crawl. Thank you so much, Girl Scout Troop 2800 for putting on another great craft. And the story walk, which began earlier in the week, will resume. And then there will be an animal encounter after that, something um, to look forward to, as well as very special performance at the virtual fire circle stage today from author Diane Lang, who was reading her book, Fur Feather Fun. How special. I'm so blown away that we have so much great support for the spring fair. Um, and then following that will be uh, people from Keen Coffee uh, showing us what a pour over is like for you coffee aficionados. And even more cool, Keen Coffee um, is donating 15% to the ENC for any orders of coffee beans or Hario products on their website keencoffee.com starting tomorrow through May 24th if you mention ENC Spring Fair in the customer notes at checkout. Um, and then for the day of the Spring Fair, that's tomorrow, the official day, and the following day, um, you will get 25% off your delicious cold brew and nitro cold brew coffee if you order through the Joe Coffee app using promo code ENC20. And that's like just one of the many different cool um, deals that some of our Saber OC sponsors are putting together for you this week. Um, I can't wait to take advantage of some of them. I also, if I haven't already, I will soon be putting up my picture of myself in my favorite spring themed costume or face paint. It might be this picture now. Um, and so we want you to do the same, decorate yourself in your spring themed costume, maybe dress like a butterfly or a caterpillar, munch on some leaves for a picture, lettuce is good. Um, and then post your photo on Instagram sometime before the end of the day tomorrow, before I think the fair ends at three. Um, tag it hashtag 2020 ENC Spring Fair for a chance to win awesome prizes and secret message if you get um, hashtag support your nature center on there as well you might get extra credit. Okay we want people to support their nature center. Now last but not least of course um, I want to just quickly read this paragraph to you because I can't memorize stuff very well and it's very important that you hear it. 
Um, this pandemic has been challenging for all of us, but some members of our community have been thrust into the front lines of this public health crisis. Medical professionals, police officers, firefighters, grocery workers, package deliverers, and other essential workers have made untold sacrifices to get us through this. The ENC wants to shine a light on these heroes and give them something back in return. So here's where you come in. Nominate a frontline worker you know to receive their own private two-hour retreat at the Nature Center where they can enjoy the healing power of nature with their family. Nominate your frontline hero by sending a short 100 word or less description and photo to mark at encenter.org and the winning heroes will be announced at the end of tomorrow, at the end of the virtual spring here tomorrow by our executive all right, have a great time today, um, and we will, we will all see you on Sunday uh, tomorrow as well. everyone welcome to day four of our spring for your craft crawl thank you again to everybody who's been participating with us all week long here are some of your egg carton bats that you made from yesterday's video Now let's continue our craft crawl story. Flowers are calling a little moose. No, not a moose. What would be the use? They're calling a beetle to eat their pollen loose. Flowers are calling a rabbit to stop. No, not a rabbit. It's not their habit to call on a rabbit. He might grab it. They're calling a bee fly to visit their spot. Now you can go ahead and watch this video to learn how to make a pipe cleaner fly. And after you make your craft, make sure you submit a picture of it to Raquel at encenter.org and it'll be featured in our last craft crawl video tomorrow. Thank you. Hello, my name is Becca and I'm from Shoot 2800. Our theme is pollinators and I'm going to be showing you the fly craft. Most people don't know what flies are pollinators. They land on everything including flowers and they pick up pollen on their legs and wings. When they fly off, they distribute it everywhere. This is what my cork fly looks like, and I'm gonna teach you how to make it today. For this activity, you're gonna need a cork, black paint, white paint, glue, a paintbrush or two, scissors, and some paper, white or blue. Step one is paint your entire cork black like this. It might be hard for the paint to stick. Now you leave it down and let it dry for a little while. Next, we're going to do the fly's wings while it's drying. I have a template, and so now I'm going to draw around the template to make 
the wings. Now take your scissors, or scissors, whichever one, and start cutting out your fly's wings. And here you are, your two wings. If you need help with scissors, go ahead and ask your parent for help. They'll gladly cut out the wings for you. Now that your paint is dry, go ahead and take a smaller paintbrush and use the white paint to paint eyes onto your fly. You don't have to wait for the eyes to dry to put the wings on. The wings are the final step. Now, what you want to do with the wings is you want to bend the very tip of it back for both of them. And then on the bottom of the wings, you want to put glue on them. The tiniest bit of glue though. There you go. Here's your fly. Thank you for watching this video on how to make a cork fly out of fully recyclable materials. Hi, my name is Aria. I'm a naturalist at the Environmental Nature Center. And the first time that I actually spent time here at the Nature Center was as a volunteer, as a leader in training. And so I volunteered here as a leader in training in seventh and eighth grade. And then I went off to school, and then when I came back to Orange County, I saw that they were hiring for a naturalist position. I thought it would be a really great way for me to be able to be outside, teach outside, and teach a lot of environmental education. So the friend that I have with here today, with me here today, is Fernanda. And Fernanda is a king snake, and the place that she gets her name from is the fact that she actually eats other snakes. So Fernanda will eat reptiles and birds and things like mice and a lot of the small animals that live here at the Nature Center, but she will actually also eat other snakes. That's where her name comes from. So Fernanda doesn't start off her life looking like this really big snake. She starts her life off as an egg, as an egg. And then when she is born, she's born as a really small snake, and then she will grow bigger and bigger. And so Fernanda, Fernanda's skin, the outside of her, doesn't actually grow with her. So when she gets a little bit bigger, what she has to do is she has to shed all of her skin off because her skin is too tight for her body. So she will shed all of her skin and then actually grow a new layer of skin, a new layer of skin. So Fernanda has really nice brown and yellow coloring, brown and yellow coloring. If you come to the Nature Center and you walk around and you look at our dirt and you look at the ground, you'll see a lot of brown and yellow. So she uses her colors to be able to camouflage really, really well into her surroundings. So if you come and pet Fernanda, you'll see that her scales are really, really smooth. So her scales are what help her do a lot of different things. So her smooth scales help her move really, really quickly through the dirt. And like I said, her colors really help her camouflage. But what they also do is they also kind of act, they do the same thing that chapstick does. So they're really, really smooth, but they also act as a way to keep in a lot of the moisture because a lot of the places that king snakes live are really hot and really dry, especially in the desert. So her scales, the outside of her, helps her keep 
really nice and, and, and not dry out in the desert. So if you see what Fernanda's doing, she's wrapping herself around my hand uh, for a couple different reasons. One of the main ones is because my hands are really warm. And so snakes are cold-blooded, which means that they can't warm up by moving around. So what they do is they have to sit in the sun, sit somewhere warm in order to get warm, which is why she's wrapping herself around my hands, because my hands are nice and warm. So the other thing that Fernanda's doing is, if you can see, she is sticking her tongue in and out. That is actually how snakes smell, and that's how they move. So Fernanda's tongue is forked like this, which means if she smells some food over here, she can use her forked tongue to be able to tell to go in that direction. Same thing, if she smells some food over here, she can tell there's food over there and move in that direction. So snakes eat their food in two different ways. So they either are venomous snakes, which means they have venom in their fangs and they bite their food and they inject their venom in order to eat their food, or they are constrictor snakes, which means they wrap around their food really, really tightly and then they after they've constricted their food, they will eat it. So Fernanda here is a constrictor snake, which means she will wrap around her food tightly until the, their food stops breathing, and then she will eat her food. So there's another thing that's really cool about snake scales, is that snake scales are just like our fingernails. So they kind of feel the same way. A lot of people, when they feel a snake for the first time, they think it feels really, really wet. But what it actually feels like is it's really smooth. It's so smooth that it will feel a little bit wet. So if you do pet a snake, if you come and get to pet Fernanda, you will pet her from her head to her tail because if you pet her the wrong way, it's like ripping out her fingernails. It's like the same thing. So these scales do a lot of good for her. They shield her, and they, they keep the moisture in, they do a lot of good. So if you ever get a chance to come down to the nature center sometime, you can come and say hi to Fernanda Arcade. I'm Diane Lang, and I'm here today to share a book I've written with you. It's called Fur, Feather, Fin, All of Us Are Kin. Um, and by that I mean, kin is kind of an old-fashioned word, and it means relatives. It means who we're related to. Your cousins are your kin, your brother and sister are your kin. Um, so we're not cousins with octopus and eels and um, what are other animals on here, various birds, seahorse. Um, no, but we share the world with them and we have a lot in common with them. We all want to stay safe, we all want to take care of our young, we want to get food, we want to have clean water, and so we have so much in common and we need each other. So I would say that we are kin. So I'm going to read this book to you today. I wish I could be with you in person, but I am doing this at the time that we're all staying home and staying safe, so not for today. So here's how it starts. All animals on earth are kin, while not the same outside or in. Some we stroke with loving hand, some we don't yet understand. But we're all linked in families with variations such as these. First of all, I'll start with the group that we are part of, and you probably know what that is. Milk to drink and furry hide, mammals keep warm from inside. Their babies are not hatched, they're born, no matter how their fur is worn. All need a parent when they're new. We sure do jump on when we're first born. Like humans, yes, we're mammals too. We have the birds, the birds we love so much. Feathers keep birds warm and dry, giving them the shape to fly. Some will soar, some probe the sand. Flightless loved ones live life on land. Some seek nectar in each bloom. Those who hunt will watch.
then zoom. The snowy owl here is zooming down on the lemming. That's what they have for uh, their meals up in the snowy high Arctic area. Amphibians. You've probably heard of amphibians, at least you've heard of frogs and toads. Changing body, smooth, moist skin, that is an amphibian. Metamorphosis, the road for changing tadpole into toad. Or, salamander, frog, or newt, and at the end, a whole new suit. So amphibians are the wet ones. The dry ones are the reptiles. Reptiles dry and scaly skin keeps the warmth from outside in. Snakes and lizards seek the sun, as basking turtles long have done. Some have a smooth and graceful glide. Some run or climb or dig to hide. That lizard is hiding from the roadrunner, and roadrunners are kind of famous for eating reptiles, including the rattlesnakes. A roadrunner can whack a rattlesnake faster than a rattlesnake can bite a roadrunner. Pretty interesting. Now I'm going to talk about uh, the big group with a big name for all of them, arthropods. Arthropods mean insects and spiders and scorpions and even lobsters. So here's about arthropods. Arthropods have hard outsides, jointed legs and varied lives. Some will live beneath the seas while others lightly ride the breeze. From insects chewing on a stem to spiders who are eating them. Now we need insects. We definitely need insects. They pollinate our food, our food crops. They also eat dead plants and animals so that the nutrients can return to the soil. Insects are very important, but we don't want too many and we would be knee deep in insects if it weren't for spiders because that's what spiders eat. So spiders are our little eight-legged heroes. Now, let's get in the water a little bit. Fish have bones plus gills to get oxygen from where it's wet. Some have shapes somewhat alike, like salmon, trout, catfish, or pike, but some are shaped a different way. This could be surprising to you. It was surprising to me when I learned. Such as seahorse, eel, or ray. They have gills and they have bone and they're fish. Now there are other animals living in the water, not just fish, and so I kind of put them all together. So there's so many different kinds um, that I just called the water dwellers. More water dwellers live offshore in tidal pools on ocean floor. Some cling to rocks while some float free, our sandy, salty family. With tentacles or fins or spines, so many different shapes in the water. Life underwater intertwines. Now in this picture, the uh, giant squid is intertwining with the whale, probably trying to get away from it. But what I also meant by inter intertwining was how um, all of the ecosystem under the water, just like up here on land, needs each other and intertwines. Now, here's a maybe even, maybe not a bigger word, but a more unusual. I'm going to talk about detritivores. It's a whole different kind, many, many different kinds of animals who um, turn dead stuff um, in the forest and elsewhere into new healthy soil. That means worms and snails and beetles and many kinds of bugs. And so I just, I call them all detritivores. Detritivores, so oft forgotten, dine on things both dead and rotten. Worms and bugs make their dessert of rot into the richest dirt, underground or deep in bark. You often do not see them. They're, he they're heroes of the damp and dark. We need our detritivores. We need all of this. From lofty height to humble base, 
every creature has a place, as well as needs like food, fresh air, a place of safety, nest, or lair. And while we're different here on earth, in eating, moving, giving birth, common things make us complete. Minds that work and hearts that beat. That's what makes us all kin. And that's why we as people can learn more about all the other kinds of animals and understand how important they are uh, to the world, appreciate them, love the ones you want, um, acknowledge the others, but just know that they're all important. Fur, feather, fin, all of us are kin. Now I have a couple critters here with me today um, to beat. I'm gonna reach down and get one of them that, oh, was right under my feet a minute ago. Okay. Um, I'll go and get him in a minute. <laughs> and I'll start with this guy. A very misunderstood, unappreciated animal. This is, okay, my camera went dark. I hope yours didn't. Okay. There we go. Sorry about that. This is a tarantula. This is my pet tarantula. I've had pet tarantulas for a long time, mostly so I could talk about an unloved animal. There's so many unloved, unappreciated animals. My first book had a turkey vulture in the title, and they're definitely important but unloved, but it's kind of hard to keep one as a pet. Besides, I think it's illegal. So I have a tarantula. Now tarantulas, like other spiders, eat insects, so they're very important. But they are very laid back animals. They're very calm and not inclined to bite. I've been handling tarantulas for uh, 20 years and I've never been bitten by a tarantula because I always handle it very gently. In general, animals who are not afraid are not going to bite you. Um, tarantulas have a very good sense of smell and he can smell through his feet that he's on my hand, the same familiar hand. He says, oh, I've been here before. I don't have to worry when I'm smelling this. So he's just fine. If he were to get confused, if I somehow were to handle him roughly or too fast, and he got afraid and, and bit me, I would say, ow, because the fangs are sharp. But I wouldn't have to go to the doctor. Their venom is not particularly harmful to people. It's not like black widow venom. But that's never happened to me. And I do love to talk about tarantulas because they're visible spiders and they're so important. So I'm gonna bring him up where you can see his, whoops, how does this work? Oh, that's the back end, I'll talk about that in a minute. It's a little bump, a little dark bump kind of in the front. And um, those are all eight of his eyes. So they have very tiny eyes. My guess is that since they live in burrows under the ground, they only have to sense that there's, if a shadow comes overhead, if it's a predator or something like that. I don't think they can see detail very well at all. And I'll show you the back end of him. If I can get this right. Hello, there. He's kind of bald. Well, when he sheds again, sheds his exoskeleton because he's an arthropod. Arthropods all have exoskeletons. They don't have bones inside. They have their hardest parts on the outside. And when he sheds and climbs out of his old one and has a new one, he'll have new, new hairs back there. Why does he need those hairs? Well, out in the wild, that is his defense. If a predator comes along, like a coyote or a fox, he will sense it and use his back legs to flip those hairs off and they float into the air. They don't shoot their hairs. They can't do that, but they can flick them off and those hairs have a little chemical and a little barb in them you can't even see. They get into your skin and really burn. So if it got into the eyes or nose of a predator, that predator would be out of there really fast. So it's a pretty good defense. So um, this is a male tarantula. He unfortunately is only live a couple more years probably because male tarantulas only live seven or eight years. Females might live 20 or 25, maybe even more. I know guys, that's not fair, but that's just the way it is. So I wanted to share this guy, um, just to, to help people see that, you know, he, he moves slowly. Um, they're, they're just calm, nice animals. Now, even if you picked one up in the wild, you probably wouldn't get bitten, but I'm not encouraging you to do that. 
because it's not respectful to the wild animal. When we see wild animals, if we're outside or hiking or walking, well, lucky us. But we need to just look at them. Listen if they're making noises. Go home and learn about them if you want and love, but always leave them alone. And we don't feed wild animals ever, except maybe if you want to put a, a bird feeder that you keep nice and clean. Because they get the food that they should have. The food we give them probably isn't, isn't helpful to them, isn't healthy and they might lose some skills in getting their own food. Now I need to look around and see where my other little guy went to. I'll be right back. Okay, so tortoises are slow, and I saw them down there a minute ago, um, but they're determined, and they keep on going. When they're going someplace, they keep on going. So I have desert tortoises um, that I didn't take out of the desert, um, they were hatched in captivity, and I'm not quite sure why. Um, I got them when they were young, but once they're in captivity, they can't be taken back to the desert because they might uh, pick up their version of coronavirus and spread it to other, um, um, they might get it in captivity, spread it to other tortoises, and we wouldn't know. So, um, so the tortoises I have are going to be in captivity for a long time. So I have his brother instead of the one that I, I thought I was setting up to. To visit with you here. So here is um, here's his brother, nice desert tortoise. Um, they are a type of turtle, but certainly not the same type as pond turtles or sea turtles. Pond turtles and sea turtles have um, narrow flippers for swimming. Well, look at these guys. Those are not good shaped for swimming, but they are well shaped for digging. And out in the desert, they don't really love it super hot, even with the shell. If it's too hot, they uh, dig uh, down into the, the sand and the dirt and tells the temperature that's just right for them. And then in the winter time, uh, when it's going to be really cold, again, they dig down to where it's warmer. Now these tortoises at my house just woke up from their hibernation. They have had a five month nap. In reptiles, we actually call it brumation but it's like hibernation. So for five months, they, it's, their bodies cool down, they're kept in a cool place, and because they're cold-blooded animals, that means that their um, temperature is the same as the temperature around them. They can afford to slow down their breathing, slow down their heart rate, and they're not using calories. So they don't eat that whole time. So now they are awake and they'd like to be eating. But where I am right now, it's been overcast and cold, and uh, rainy. So I've been trying to keep the house warm enough for them that they might want to eat. They're not going to eat until their bodies warm up so that they can digest. They somehow know that it's not safe to eat if they're too cool. But they do need the UV rays of real sunlight. So they had a few days of that before it started raining again. And tomorrow we're supposed to get sunshine again. So um, this little guy will be out there. Um, they have, they, so tortoises eat Nothing but vegetation. They don't eat little critters in ponds like pond turtles do. They certainly don't eat jellyfish like sea turtles do. They just eat plants. Out in the desert, they love blossoms and different kinds of desert plants. And they have favorites here. They love dandelion um, um, flowers and they love clover flowers. So I am going to put the computer down now. I'm going to put a little couple little blossoms in front of my tortoise here. Someone else had him first that named him Davis. So this is Davis and I guess I'll yeah, put it down like that. Put a couple blossoms. There's a dandelion and there's clover and there's a rose petal. They have a good sense of smell so he probably and, and also they see color so he can choose if he would like one of those things. Um, we'll see if he goes for it. He has been spending the morning asleep, so um, he may not be wakeful enough to think about eating. So let's look at his nice shell on top. The top shell is called the carapace. The bottom shell is called the plastron, and then they're connected on the side. His backbone is actually fused to his shell. It's part of the shell. When I was little, a long, long time ago, cartoons uh, showed, oh, no flowers here? Showed 
turtles um, or tortoises climbing out of their shells so they could run faster. Well, of course, that's fictional. Um, they can't do that. They're kind of slow, but they keep on going. As I said, I lost my first tortoise on the, in the room somewhere. I'll, I'll find him later. And they are endangered, the desert tortoises are. So um, we hope that people will remember that as part of the desert. If you're ever lucky enough to see one in the desert, maybe you see it in the road, take it off the road. Um, well, actually, maybe just urge it off the road because even um, if you pick it up, it's dangerous for the tortoise. Um, and here's why. Because they don't get much um, actual free water to drink in the, in the desert they hold on to all the moisture of the plants they eat and it takes a long time to get all the moisture stored up that they need and if they are picked up um, by someone is an unusual thing mine are picked up all the time but they're used to it if they're picked up in the wild they will be afraid they'll think they want to be as light as possible to get away and they will get rid of all the moisture that they have they will pee it all out so it's not even good to pick them up but if you can urge them off the road should you be lucky enough to see one Okay, maybe he's gonna go check out the the camera now. It doesn't look like he's gonna eat it all. Okay, I'm gonna put him down now. He said, what was that? That was a strange thing. So I love all sorts of animals. I used to be so afraid of reptiles. I was afraid of lizards, I was afraid of snakes. And now I just love them all. And at the nature centers where I've worked, where it's appropriate to pick them up and show them to people, I love to pick them up and do programs with them and get to know them. And they get to know all the handlers too because they have a sense of smell and they can pick up lots of um, clues from us. On the problem. They might know our different heartbeats. So they say, oh yes, I'm in a safe place again. So the animals that are um, my pets or they're in captivity, we handle them to share but I wouldn't go out in nature and pick up, a, pick up a wild animal. It wouldn't be safe for me, and I said it wouldn't be um, respectful to the animal, because the animal wouldn't feel safe. Um, but all of us, as people, as mammals, as human beings, as residents of the earth, can appreciate all the animals that live there, and know that we're, whether we have fur, or hair, or feather, or fin, all of us are kin. Thank you very much. ENC's Virtual Spring Fair. My name is Brittany Leslie and I'm with Key and Coffee. I'm sorry we couldn't be there in person to brew you some coffee today, but there's no reason why you can't do that at home. So today we're going to go over how to brew a Hario V64 over. The materials you'll need for your pour over are filtered water, preferably reverse osmosis, a Hario coffee dripper, a scale that can measure in grams, Hario paper filters, your favorite fresh roasted Keen coffee, a grinder, either manual or electric, and a vessel for your coffee to brew into. All right, let's learn how to do a hard V64 over. First things first, we'll need to heat our water up to 202 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, if you can't program your kettle to 202 degrees, what you can do is get your water to boiling, then wait a few minutes in order for the water to cool down to that 202 degrees. Any hotter, it'll burn your coffee, which we don't want. All right, now we need some coffee. So we're gonna use a one to 16 ratio today. We're gonna use 25 grams of coffee in and 400 grams of water. This brew time will be between two and a half to three and a half minutes. So um, we'll grind our coffee first. I'll take a little cup like that. We'll tear our scale so that it's at zero. And I will go ahead and pour 25 grams of coffee 
coffee. And now the grind of this coffee is very similar to sand. It's a little bit finer, but not as fine as espresso and where it like pumps together, we don't want that. That's too fine. Too fine will make your coffee taste very bitter. And if you don't have enough coffee, it'll taste kind of sour. So grind size is very important when it comes to brewing. All right, so now that our coffee is ground, um, next let's get our vessel ready. So Harda does sell a server. I do not have that server, but I do have a mason jar, but I, we will need the Harda dripper. So I'll place the dripper on top of our server, just like so. Next we'll need a Hario filter. This is very important that we fold the filter on its seam so it fits nicely into the dripper and place it like so. Now, if I just start brewing just like this, I would pick up all of the paper tastes that are in the filter. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pre-wet our filter with the hot water and get out all that paper taste because we don't want our coffee to like paper especially when we're buying such nice beans. So I'll let that completely drip through. And what's nice is that it's also heating up the server um, while I'm getting to rinse out the filter so it's killing two birds with one stone. All right, so now our vessel is nice and warm. Our filter is now uh, pretty wet. I'm gonna throw away this water. Don't forget that. And you're just watering down your coffee with paper water. So now I'm gonna make sure to tear my steel syrup so it's at zero. All right, I'm gonna take the coffee grounds and pour them directly into the center of the dripper. It should be a nice little mound, 25 grams, perfect. Now I can take my server, just give it a gentle shake and make sure our grounds are nice and even because we don't want an uneven extraction when we're brewing. Now we're ready to brew. What I'll do, I'm gonna tear my scale to zero again. If you have a timer, awesome. Also cell phones are great and they have timers on them as well. So I'm going to go ahead and start my stopwatch. And what we're going to do is we're going to start with a 30 second bloom. So a bloom is when you're pouring the hot water onto your grounds. And we're going to give it 30 seconds time in order for the gases to release from the coffee. Especially since we're using fresh roasted coffee, the grounds are going to have a lot of gases that might interfere with the extraction. So this bloom period allows those gases to escape and not interfere with it as much. So whenever you are ready, we're going to get our timer, our stopwatch, Click start, and I'm going to find a center point between the dripper and the center of my grounds, and I'm going to do a circular pour motion, and I'm going to get all of the grounds wet. It doesn't require that much water. I'm going to do this, I think it takes about like 50 grams, 50 grams at most of water. So all my grounds are now wet. I'm going to wait until we get to that 30 second mark. Your coffee should be smelling super fragrant right now. You might see bubbles appear from the surface that means your coffee's fresh. It looks really good to go. Okay, we're at 30 seconds. I'm gonna pick that center point and in a circular pulse motion, I'm gonna get my coffee scale to read about 150 grams. I'm finding a midway point between the top of the dripper and the center of my grounds. So now coffee's starting to brew. I'm going to wait for the level of the water to go down just a few centimeters, and then I'm going to go ahead in that same exact path, circular motion, bring it to the top of the slurry. So we're going to repeat this procedure of pouring the water um, into the slurry point until our scale reads 400 grams. And so that's 400 grams of water to our 25 grams of coffee. Pour overs are a lot of fun because you get to watch the coffee in its journey from the bean to grounds, to an amazing cup. And all the while, you get to smell the great aromatics that fresh coffee has. All right, now we're getting towards the end of our abstraction. The water is slowly making its way down through the last of the grounds. Um, we will consider it complete though until it's finally finished dripping, and then we're left with an awesome cup of coffee. Now, if you want to preheat your cup, your favorite cup, that's a good way to keep your coffee hot longer, instead of microwaving it, which you could also do. Or preheating. Just make sure to throw out your water like you threw out your water with your vessel. All right, perfect. So that took about three and a half minutes. I'm gonna take my grounds, 
You can either toss them or, for the sake of using our resources, we can take these coffee grounds, we can put them in our garden if we would like it because it acts as a natural, organic fertilizer. We can also use this as a scrub because I don't know about you guys, I don't want to pay $20 for coffee grounds to get scrub on my body when I have some right here. Um, there are many uses you can use coffee grounds for cooking. Um, we're going to take these. I will put them aside for later. All right, take your cup of coffee and we'll pour it into your favorite mug. And thank you for learning how to make a hard IP60 pour brew with me today. Um, again, today I used our natural Ethiopian coffee, but if you want to check out all of our coffee offerings, you can go to keencoffee.com. And our offerings change throughout the year. Sometimes we have some very special ones. And thank you guys so much for learning how to do a pour over with me today. Until next time. Enjoy. Key and Coffee has two special offers for the ENC Virtual Spring Fair. Get 25% off any cold brew or nitro cold brew when you order for pickup at our Newport Beach Coffee House through the Joe Coffee app. Download it by texting COFFEE to 474747 and enter the promo code ENC20 at checkout. Also, want to support the ENC? Order any Hario pour-over brewing equipment, accessories, or coffee beans online at keyandcoffee.com, and we will donate 15% of your order to the ENC Spring Fair fundraiser. Hi everyone, I'm Chef Alejandro Pedia, Executive Chef at the Five Pounds Inside Door here in Corona Del Mar, California. Uh, today we'll be putting together our Cyber Famous Door and Chicken Pot Pie. Uh, in the meantime, um, on the day, I'd like to more people to join us. Um, I'd like to um, welcome any questions in the meantime uh, regarding our pot pies. Uh, that will be featuring on Sundays for uh, essentially a take and bake where we will offer it for you and make it in your own home so you'll have those really great warning scents in your home or uh, reminiscent of side door. Oh, we do have a question. We'd love, uh, some of the guests would love to know where you've worked before, a little bit of your background. Oh, wow. Well, a little bit of my background. Okay. So, uh, I was born and raised in Los Angeles. I worked for a few years at a Tommy restaurant in Los Angeles, then moved to New York and worked at some Michigan star restaurants there. And then when I moved back, I essentially really deep dived into state houses. Um, I worked in downtown LA, I worked for Peace and Restaurant in Irvine, and then uh, within a few years of that, I ended up here at the Five Pounds Side Door where I'll be reaching my third year anniversary in October. So, I'm going to talk about So, um, our Five Pounds and Side Door. Takeout is what we now offering the Jadori Chicken Pot Pie on Sundays. Um, we offer our delivery and takeout Tuesday through Sunday from 4 o'clock to 8 o'clock. Um, you guys can call in or order online um, anytime before that. We need to open up our phones at 4 o'clock and we have someone standing by. So, okay. okay. So let's get started. Uh, for those of you who just joined us, um, my name is Alejandra Padilla. I'm the executive chef at the Five Pound Side Door. We'll be making our very popular side door dairy chicken pot pie. So I have a um, all our ingredients laid out for us here, just so you guys can get a visual of really what goes into this pot pie. Uh, we have our dairy chicken whole, which we do roast in house. I'll be seasoning it with our Lori seasoned salt. And uh, we roast it uh, very warm and let it cool. And then we take it apart and separate the breasts from the legs and the thighs. And then we combine a little bit of the dark meat and a little bit of the white meat for that. Uh, we also have our cream mushrooms roasted. 
and we also have our chili mushroom uh, onions. Sorry, excuse me. We have a combination here of our celery and carrots, which are sautéed with some olive oil and some thyme. And uh, we have the egg, which we brush our puff pastry with. Um, that's the top, which is that really beautiful crust that you see uh, when you get there. And we have the meat here that's been diced and roasted. And lastly, but not least, and one of the things that I think that really puts all the flavors together is the chicken gravy that we serve in there, which makes um, the Jidori chicken pot pie one of a really great item because it has everything in it. It has protein in it, it has vegetables in it, it's got a sauce inside of it, and it's got a really great vessel on top, which is a puff pastry to like really soak up all those flavors. Um, but since we're doing it as a as a takeout. Um, currently, we're putting it in this foil here. Um, normally, and if some of you who know, we usually do it in a really beautiful ceramic, and we serve it hot right out of the oven. Um, but for now, we're putting it in this aluminum. So let's get started uh, with some of these ingredients here. Once you cook all your ingredients separately, it really comes together very easily. But one of the things that takes the most time is cooking your chicken, but you can be very efficient. While you cook your chicken, you can dice all your vegetables, you can roast your chipotle onions in the same pot, you can saute your mushrooms as well, and you can uh, cut your puff pastry to fit your uh, your dish where it goes in. You can also be making the chicken gravy. Uh, one of the great things about this chicken here is as soon as we take all the really delicious meat out of it, uh, what we do is we cook it again with a lot of aromatics. So thyme, peppercorn, bay leaf, onion, we add water to it and essentially we make a stock. With that stock, we use it to make the gravy. So this bird is a very giving animal here that we use, um, sort of like a cross utilization of product. So let's get started. Um, what we have first, and you can do this in any order that you like. Uh, what I like to do is start off with the uh, creamy mushrooms. And you want to just sprinkle it at the bottom um, of the pan here. Uh, because this pan is a little bit light, uh, when you do take it at home and bake it in your own kitchen, try and get a cookie sheet or a sheet tray or a pan underneath it uh, because when it does get hot, it warms up and it gets a little bit flimsy. So this is just a little bit better so that you guys can have more control of your product. Um, after you put in the mushrooms, I like to put in some of those chili onions that uh, were roasted, salt, fresh ground pepper. Uh, you can also add thyme to this if you like. I like to sprinkle a little bit of turbinado sugar. It really helps bring out the sugars in the onions and make them a little bit sweeter. Uh, and then we put in the vegetable portion of this which is the sauteed celery and carrots. We sprinkle that. Um, I personally don't like putting a lot of carrots in there. I think they have a lot of sweetness to them and I think it sort of goes against like the really robust flavor of the Jidori chicken. So what we're looking for is more of a savory flavor. And then lastly, you get the, uh, the diced chicken, which we have here. Um, and this is a combination of uh, leg meat, thigh meat, and grass on there, which makes it really hearty. And you want to have like those really nice big pieces and chunks so that you can have like a really nice uh, fork pull. Of One of the things that um, we like to do here is we like to put a good amount of gravy in this item. And I think it's really key because the gravy um, helps keep everything moist. And, uh, really helps keep everything through and this this pot pie is a very generous pot pie like I said it's got a little bit of everything vegetables protein um, sauce this could be good for about two people um, or one person who is very enthusiastic about pot pie um, we just cover that up here with the gravy on top on the side and what's really cool about this is that because we use the, the chicken stock made from the Jidori chicken, it sort of just re 
infuses the flavor and it maximizes the flavor of the chicken, especially since we're using the same chickens that we essentially plucked or put the meat out of and put back in. So that's what I really like about this dish is that we get to personalize some of the ingredients and nothing goes to waste. As you know, we work in this restaurant industry, we don't like to waste food at all. So um, it's a really great product to have in our uh, restaurant. Lastly, like I said, this goes really fast after you have everything done. Uh, what you want to do is take your puff pastry sheet. You can buy these at any market. Um, you know, any any supermarket has it in its freezer section. Um, and what you want to do is you just want to cut it out the same size as your casserole or your dish or even your pot and you just lay it on top. And then one of the finishing touches here that we do is we like to take a little knife and we like to just put a little bit of varnish, varnish, not really a varnish, or just a little bit of more style to it. Um, you just sort of score it, which means you make a design into it. You don't have to limit yourself to doing these diamond shapes. You can do anything you want. You can have fun with it. You can do circles. You can do punch outs. Anything you really like. Uh, I essentially just like doing this one because it's more consistent and it's actually um, pretty familiar for people who have our Jadori Chicken Pot Pie normally. And then we take our uh, egg wash. So this is just a cracked egg with a little bit of milk in it. And we just really quickly brush it on top. And what this is going to do is going to help it give it a really beautiful sheen. Um, how to bake it as well. And that's why we put a sheet tray because it's going to mess it And you just brush it along. Uh, you don't need too much. A little bit goes a long way. And you just sort of tuck in the edges on there. And lastly, you take a little bit of Maldon salt, which is a very coarse sea salt that we like to use as a finishing touch. And we put that up on top. Right, it gives it a little bit of that extra crunch and a little bit of extra flavors. Um, again, we like to build a lot of flavors here. Um, you know, starting with all our vegetables, which are seasoned, our chicken that is seasoned, and then at the, at the end. So every time you take a bite, there's layers of flavor. And then um, put this in your oven. You have an oven that should be set at 375 degrees to be heated. Um, and you pop that in with the sheet tray underneath so that when you take it out of your oven at home, it's not wobbly or it's not too hot to handle. And um, essentially that's why it's a heat and serve and you pop it in for about 10 minutes. Depending on your oven, sometimes some ovens don't get as hot as others. Um, you kind of want to keep an eye on it. Try not to open your oven. I know that's very tempting. Um, every time you open up your oven, you take about 10 degrees out of your oven. So, um, patient and it's definitely worth the wait. And at the end you should have something that looks similar to this. Um, again it's good for about one to two people. Um, it's really great. It, like I said it's got a little bit of everything. Vegetables, meat, sauce and a really great crust on top. You see how glazed it is and beautiful and you see like the coarseness of the salt as well. So does anybody have any questions? Okay. Again, we're offering the pot pie on Sundays only as a heat and serve. So again, you um, we brush it, we assemble it for you, we put it in the tin for you, we brush it with the egg and the Maldon sea salt on top, and all you do is bake it at 375, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, in the oven you should be ready to go chef we do have a question can you freeze the chicken pot pie so if somebody orders it they want to know if they can freeze it to cook at a later time oh absolutely yes it's a really great product um it can live in your refrigerator for about two days as well and it bakes beautifully um, you can keep it in your freezer for about up to five days just make sure that it's wrapped up tightly um so it's even in your back freezer burn just make sure you don't put it directly from the freezer into your oven. What you want to do is let it thaw out a little bit in your refrigerator. We do have another question, Chef. Uh, what time can uh, I get my order on Sunday? 
Uh, you can pick it up as early as 4 p.m. Uh, we open up, but if for any reason you somebody needs to get it earlier than that, we can most definitely make that happen. If you just put in the orders at least 24 hours in advance, we can have it ready for you as early as 4 p.m. And one more question, where, how do they order? Oh, you can order online, uh, or you can follow us here at our restaurant, uh, online, 5 um, on our link. Oh. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, thank you so much for joining us today on our Chicken Pot Pie demo. Um, and uh, it was really great featuring one of the most popular items for side door on next Thursday we'll be featuring uh, Tracy and our uh, creamery takeover with our beer cheese pairing uh, we'll be featuring Cypress Grove cheeses and Russian River Brewing 7 o'clock Facebook Live mm -hmm.